In this video, we're going to talk all about. In this video, we're going to talk all about the coffee cart that we've been working on here at Decent Espresso. And years ago, almost eight years ago, I started working on a coffee cart that I made with the. I, Okay, let's just start over so we don't have that echo. Okay, are we good? All right. In this video, we're gonna talk about the coffee cart that we've been working on for about eight years here at Decent Espresso. And if you've been following our YouTube channel, you'll see my very first attempts when I first visit Ikea in France and I buy all sorts of equipment off Amazon, put on my ski goggles and try and carve things up. Since then, things have gotten a bit more polished, as you can see here. And I want to walk through kind of everything that we've learned about making coffee carts in this video and what we're providing and what you can provide. First thing I want to talk about is, oh my God, we kind of started a movement of coffee carts around the world. Starting with the IKEA coffee cart, we sell the top, the machine, and then people run with it. You can see this printed thing here. People print all sorts of other things from the, the menu of the cafe that they're, from the front that you can see printed here, people go creative in all sorts of ways, doing things that are steampunky, that are kind of uh, home decor, and you'll see people put these carts in their homes as little coffee nooks, as well as push them out at farmer's markets. Some of them have them in offices. They're kind of all over the world. And what's been really quite fun is I tried to open source this so that you don't even have to use our coffee machine. You can just learn how we've gone about it. And there's all these offshoots of people who've taken bits from what we've done and made their own creative things. And that's super fun. I think the whole world will benefit by having a whole lot more coffee carts out there. And we're going to share with you what we've learned. All right, so that's the history. From the very beginning, the idea was to make this cheap. I mean, really cheap. And no one does cheap furniture better than IKEA. So we never want to be in the furniture business. And IKEA makes this whole family of things called Broer. You can see Broer shelves behind us here. And this is a Broer cart. They make them in various colors. They make them in black and white, with wheels, without wheels, all sorts of stuff. It starts at 99 US dollars, which is just mental. It's so cheap. We can't even ship stuff to you for that price. So always we start with Broer. And then we look at what IKEA does badly. And what they do badly is this top. In order to hit that $9 price, they give you a piece of wood that's about yay thick. It's not even a centimeter thick. It's got all these splinters coming out of it. It looks terrible. So what we do is we make these tops. You buy the Broer table, but you replace it with this top. We have tried experiments with other IKEA furniture. For years, we've had a bamboo top which is a kitchen island that Ikea makes. It looked gorgeous when we got it. Now, several years later, it's kind of an exercise of what you shouldn't do. Let's say that it has character. <laughs> um, that was the word that was coming to my mind. Character. Character, yes. Um, generally, I prefer things that clean up. These uh, coffee cart tops are made of wood, but there is a thick plastic laminate on them so that even though you might pour coffee, coffee, milk, all sorts of stuff, at the end of the day, you just wipe it clean. And years later, it still looks like that. So we do supply that top and we supply it in various configurations. This is what I call bigger brewer. And the reason is, is that there's one around 80 centimeters, another one around 100 and I think 110 centimeters. So there's brewer and bigger brewer. This bigger bore is kind of what we settled on because looking at it, you can see it's got plenty of workspace. The machines over there, pitcher rinser, lots of space. And using the smaller bore, the standard one, you can use that if you really are tight for space. In fact, one of the reasons we went with that is it fit in even the smallest elevator in Hong Kong. 
And, and that was a goal for us, as well as my teeny tiny apartment that just had like that much space more to spare. Otherwise, it couldn't fit in. So if you're tight for space, go for the normal brewer. But if you're not tight for space, go for what we call bigger brewer. We offer this top pre-cut in this configuration. Now, all these configurations are wood laminated on both sides. So if you were to flip it upside down, you would see that the espresso machine, instead of being on the left-hand side, would now be on the right-hand side. A ton of work, and I mean a ton of work, has gone into deciding this seemingly simple configuration. This setup is the one I don't like. I usually set it up flipped upside down. Most people are right-handed, and they think that the machine on the left side makes sense because you take out the porter filter with your left hand. But I'm going to show you what happens when you do the workflow in this direction. So you start here, you take the porter filter out, and then you immediately now have to switch it to your right hand to knock it out. Then you can rinse, put a towel there, go here, and now when I grind, I'm going to have to reach over here, put that there, and then flip again and grab it with my left hand. Go here, right hand again, then come over here. And you can see I'm moving a lot to make this coffee and go back here. I'm going to show you that. <clears throat> and here's what happens if you flip the whole thing upside down. It works so much better. And here we'll show uh, a video of me doing it, but I'll do it right here so we can do it. So you start with the espresso machine here and you unlock it. You can then knock into your knock box, flip it over, wipe out your porta filter, dose, grind, groom, tamp, and lock it right back into your machine. And everything is a smooth circle, kind of a heart shape of workflow. The reason we came up with that layout is because we put a challenge out for ourselves called the 10 minute challenge. And Paul and I have been trying to make espresso as fast as we can. And what we found is the coffee machine is actually not what slows us down. What slows us down is two things, the workflow, the motions, all those wasted hand swaps. Oh wait, where's my towel? Where's this? And the other thing that slows you down is weighing doses and grinding. And you'll see that we manage 92 espressos an hour just with one person if I just had my weight doses and I had two grinders. 92 an hour. That's a really fast speed with just one little coffee cart. So the best way if you need to get more espressos out per hour is to just have more carts. And each of your baristas will just have their own little cart, their own little happy place to work as fast as possible. Uh, Paul, do you have any comments on workflow? I don't know if you were the one who set this up left to right. Um, uh, it could have been, um, but uh, I think in this instance, um, I'm a little bit ambidextrous. Mm. So I think ambidextrous is not the issue. In fact, right. when you're working over here, you have to be ambidextrous because you take the porta filter out and you put it down, you do this with, your, with the, the tamper and the mm. WT tool, and then you lock in, you're doing both hands. With this setup, it actually really favors just one hand because you take mm. it out here and now you're over here and you need to get over here, right? You're, you're in the wrong place. And what you really want is you want the knock box to be over here. So as you take it out, you could knock the puck out, okay? So here I end up using my right hand quite a lot with this setup and it, it slows me down. Let's just move on to the next thing. Um, Ikea sells their brewer carts in two sizes, but there is another difference between them besides the size. The small one has wheels, the large one does not. That's slightly annoying. I suspect they do that for strength reasons, but the bigger one is way better. You can solve that one of two ways. You can buy two carts from Ikea, a small one and a big one, and swap the legs. or you can buy the big one and buy little brackets from us that we make. Um, hmm? Can you do that? Just do the last bit over again. Okay. 
from uh, the difference in the two cards? Yeah. Okay. IKEA sells their drawer cart in two sizes. There's the normal size and what I call the bigger drawer. The smaller size has wheels on it. The larger size does not. You can solve that problem one of two ways. You can either buy two carts from IKEA and swap the legs around. That totally works. Or you can buy the large one and then from us buy this wheel bracket which screws on the bottom, which is in fact cheaper than buying a second pro cart. And then the wheels screw in here. The other advantage of doing it this way is that you can go to your home supply store and buy heavy duty caster wheels that screw into this. And that's also what we do. Um, one of the goals I had with Decent Espresso was essentially reinventing everything. I, I know it sounds kind of ridiculous, but it's because as I was learning and I was frustrated, I found that pretty much everything that was out there wasn't measurement or repeatability focused, or there was some other flaw in it. So that's why, for example, we've got our own temper with a calibrated level. A funnel is super important, but the funnels out there all went into the basket and they cause channeling. So we make our own without it so that it doesn't go inside. It sits on the outside. We now have magnets on these and the advantage of the magnet. The advantage of the magnet here is that it locks on and then I can do that and it doesn't fall off. But more importantly, when I'm going around and dosing and moving quickly to quickly make coffee, this isn't going to go anywhere. So magnetized funnel really helps in the coffee workflow. The pitcher rinser, that's fine, you can go to the pitcher rinser. The pitcher rinser is probably my biggest discovery because knocking pucks out here turns out to be uh, something that leaves a fair amount of muck behind. And when someone knocks a puck out here, there's usually gunk in here. And you take a towel and you wipe it, and it takes longer than you think. And you also get gunk everywhere on the ground or around here. So instead, you knock the puck out, and then you just push it like that, and it comes back rinsed, and then all you have to do is do a towel to dry it. That workflow of knock, rinse, wipe, is super fast and, and really gets everything out of there. Also, little coffee bits inside your basket will screw up the next shot, and this really helps with that. <clears throat> the knock box is another piece we designed, and there's a bunch of things we did with this. One is this sloping front so that you don't accidentally, when you knock, get your knuckles to hit the front. And a lot of knock boxes are level, and that's a real issue. Next, it's quite large. It's made of metal, and you can see there's a big gasket here, and it just slots right in. That gasket, besides making it really easy to pull the knockbox in and out, is also a sound dampener, and that's super handy like that. Uh, some people have, however, put a different knockbox in here and then cut the hole out, and then you can just um, put a trash can underneath, and you can have a huge amount of coffee grounds go in there. Over here, we've got the coffee grinder, and you've seen in some videos where we've had two grinders. That's unusual. Usually we only go out with one coffee grinder, and we like the niche a lot because it's small, but any other grinder that's small is great. There is a cable management hole here with a gasket, and uh, there's a cable management hole here with a grommet, and this little tidy, and this little tidy. We we modify all our grinders to have these porta filter stands. And the reason is, again, speed. Grinding and waiting for your grinder is wasted time. So putting a porta filter there and closing it, letting it grind, and then coming back when it's done is just a huge time saver so that the 10, 20, 30 seconds your grinder takes can be used to pour out and measure your milk or anything else that needs doing. And that is our porta filter stand that we mod a number of grinders, stuff from Weber, from Niche, 
from the Ligum grinders, all can be modified to work with our porta filter stand. And then finally, I've got a weighed dosing area. And usually I've got some sort of intermediate um, container like this, and then a small thing like that, so I can quickly fill that up and get the dose I want. So in that case, I was 15 and three. <laughs> and uh, generally I'm trying to get within 0.3 grams of accuracy. The other trick I have is I have a spoon, which is just the right size, so it gets me, once I get used to it, pretty much at 15 grams, just with a single thing, and I lift out two or three beans if there's too much. These scales are made by us, and I don't know if you can tell here, but they're extremely fast to respond. They don't have any dampening in them. And that's on purpose because most scales have dampening to give you this illusion of stability. And they take a little bit of time to get started. So just as soon as you touch this, it just immediately reacts. Uh, and that just makes it just a little bit faster to weigh your beans. This is also plugged into USB power, and unlike most uh, Bluetooth scales out there, it will run forever plugged in, and it stays on no matter what. So it's a nice, reliable scale for whatever you need to do. Um, Paul, I've been doing a lot of talking. Is there anything mm. I have? We haven't talked about the cups. Why don't you, you can mention the cups that you, you put the cups up there. Yeah, so. Um, Why don't you face forward before yep. you start? So of course, you know, as with all carts, and if you're thinking about you know, serving some coffees, you do need some cups. And we've had these very cute four ounce double walled cups being made uh, in preparation for some uh, fairs that we're gonna do this season. And of course, you know, the obvious place to put them would be on the top. But if you did have room, you can stuff extra stop underneath. There is two shelves on this bra cart. Um, I believe you can add more shelves, but it's depending on your water, if you need to have extra room for your water or other items. Um, but yet there is room on the cart, uh, especially for the cups at the bottom layer. And, you know, having them on the top is very convenient for everybody because as you're pulling shots, it's just within arm's reach and then you're putting it underneath straight onto the scale um, and off, you're, off you go. Um, Let me show you over here. So, I don't know, you can leave the cups there. Yep. That's fine. I want to swap with you for sure. a second. And let's show the top camera. That's fine. This area here of the, of the cart, this area here of the cart has always been designed for finished drinks. So as the drinks get finished, I put them here and then people can come from behind and grab their drinks. That was always the idea over here. Uh, can you do it one more time with the front camera, please? Yep. Okay. This area here was always intended to be a place where you put finished drinks. So I tend to put the cups that I'm working on here and as I finish them, I put them back here and I call out my order or tell someone to pick up their drink. All the various cart cutouts we have have this space on one side. Uh, let's switch again. Yeah. Um, okay. In this configuration, we have printed here, and it's in our way in the sense that we can't show you what's inside here. We also can't easily reach in here and get stuff. But you've probably seen our videos all the time. We're reaching over and grabbing stuff from there. Now, this is our setup because we are in the espresso machine sales business. And so we want the machine to be facing you. If we flip this around and you just see the back of the machine, you wouldn't be quite as engaged. And a lot of coffee cart, a lot of people who do coffee carts set up the other way with the barista behind the table. That's fine, but I think you're really missing out on something if you're not showing people walking by, what the heck is that? It's got a tablet and, you know, what's he doing? And especially because people, they underestimate the amount of skill that is needed to make a really good coffee. When you do this, you're kind of naked. You're, you're, you're showing them everything you're doing. You're not hiding behind this wall. So this is the setup I quite like. Um, let me get... Uh, We have printed some new panels for some Christmas markets that we're gonna be doing. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put them right here in front. 
and yeah, they're just kind of Christmassy and fun. People aren't really going to notice them other than the idea of presents, like, oh, I should buy a decent as a present. And that's the setup that we like when we're demonstrating. However, most people flip it around and they go to the back of the machine and, oh, I'm sorry, most people flip it around and they would ask people to approach from this direction and have this open and have it printed on the other side. I don't have the bolts, but that's not a big deal. I will get this other one. Um, and we're both going to pull away so you can show the edges, okay? Mm -hmm. With this front, if you pull away here, you can see that the edges are going beyond the edge of the drawer cart. And that's just to hide what's behind and allow us to put things in. However, if this were customer facing, you probably wouldn't do that. And these edges are very prone to getting damaged. Here's another one that I had printed. And this one I like a lot. You can't hear me when I'm behind the sign. This one I like a lot because it has the menu of things you can order as well as advice. And you can see there are bolt holes here and there. The Brewer cart has holes all along these metal brackets that make it really easy to bolt in these foam printed, um, to bolt in these foam signs. I'm really surprised actually how sturdy they are. Recently I've been switching from uh, foam to this sort of compressed plastic lumber and I can put a drill bit right through it and it takes compressed bolts. We also sell, that you can buy yourself, these extra long bolts because the bolts that IKEA give you are just long enough, because they're saving every penny, just long enough to hold the cart together. The IKEA bolts are not long enough to hold the cart together and put foam board on. So that's another little bit that we include. You'll find that all the little bits we sell for the coffee par cart, you'll find that all the bits we sell for the coffee cart are quite inexpensively priced because we're looking to make money selling you this coffee machine, which is what we do uniquely in the world. We're not a unique producer of bolts. Anything you want to cover there? Um, actually, I'll, I'll mention one thing. Um, no, I, I stick it into your thing. That's fine. This foam design and several others are available as Illustrator files and Photoshop files. There's a wood effect one as well, and they're all available on our coffee cart page. These things are super cheap. They're usually 50 to 100 US to print three panels and you can just make any design you want. You should print it locally. You shouldn't have us print it and send it to you. You could. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, this here is the one espresso machine cutout top, and we have several other cutout tops besides Besides a smaller version of exactly the same layout, you can flip it either way. We have a layout for two espresso machines and another one for three. Now the two espresso machine one is quite popular because this machine is so small, it will not steam milk while it's making espresso. So if you really want to crank and you're used to steaming while you're brewing espresso, having two machines will let you do that. And part of the workflow is the same. What I actually do is I make espresso on this machine here. So I have this little space here for making espresso. And then over here is where I'm steaming the milk and then putting the drinks as I finish them. However, big caveat, we've done the 10 minute challenge and it's no faster. So you think the steam during brew is gonna be faster. Steaming during brew is not. It, it's, it's saving you maybe eight seconds, but those eight seconds you just spend doing something else that needs to happen to make coffee. So I'm not sure it makes a big difference. We also make this mega cart that has three decent espresso machines in one brewer. Now there's no space for a pitcher rinser or anything else there. That is essentially like bringing in a three group pro machine. And that is really a situation where you'd want 
two baristas, one on each side, cranking out shots, and maybe on the side, some cleanup facilities as well. That's us imitating the three group world. And some people want to do that. They want to bring a lot of machines in. I'd agree with that. And um, it, it makes, a, I think a lot of people choose them if, if they've had a previous place and it makes them more of a statement. And uh, while it does, it, it, you know, it, really have to tie into how you want it. Is it just for espresso or tea? And you, you kind of have to think about that as well. Um, if it, you are serving tea, you could have a separate station, maybe keep two for espresso and then one for milk. You know, you have, you, you have unlimited possibilities because each machine can be a standalone or work together as a, as a group of two or three. So um, yeah, I think it's it's very, very flexible system. And um, you know, if you're pairing more than one barista on multiple machines, it, it'll be a lot faster. That's Plus, sure. no one gets in each other's way. Yes, and yeah. You see that in cafes all the time. The well-run ones have somebody who does the till and latte art, and someone else pulls espresso. Yeah. The not-so-well-run ones, the people are constantly shifting roles, and, and it's a mess. And when we first started on this whole coffee cart adventure, I was asked to give a bid for a quite expensive wedding and they said i needed to make something like 2000 espressos in a one hour gap and how would i do that <laughs> and, and so i came back with well it's going to be 25 carts and, and this is what's going to happen we didn't get the job we weren't ready so it's a good thing back then but it made us think how do we scale to those sorts of just crazy numbers and and the answer is by having things that are very independent so that each time you add another machine, you really get that full productivity. You don't get diminishing returns, mm -hmm. which is what you get as you add one, two, three, four, five groups. That's it. Yes, right. You don't get that additional speed. Mm. And uh, you can kind of see that in, in the history of machines. You had like four, maybe five, six group machines, and now they're getting you know more common to have three and two. Um, and if it's smaller, even a one machine. So. Yeah, or a two group machine and then a big gap and then another two group station. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a really common one. And then they are mostly only using the two group station and then they set up the other one when they really need to go. Mm. Um, one of the things I'd hoped, one of the other things you can do with this setup is if you are a cafe, is use it for your little outdoor serving. So often people will have a little ice cream a freezer that can go outside. If you have that permission, you can set up a little coffee cart and make espressos outside. In the COVID era, that's awfully good because people are reticent often to come indoors. But it's also really good if you're doing a lot of takeaway business for work. People walking down the street see you making coffee. It's mentally very different than coming into a shop. Yeah, I like that. And it it's also makes it, um, if you have a standalone machine already in your cafe, um, having a cart option, even if it's not our machine, you can do other things uh, on top of your regular business. And um, you know, rather than having all your eggs in, in a brick and mortar shop, for example, you know, you can you can expand your business and, and explore other avenues. When I first learned to make espresso, it was actually on a coffee cart with a Lamarzoco GS3 that the coffee shop had in the back. They would use it essentially for catering, weddings, that sort of mm. thing. But when they weren't doing those, they would use it as their training machine and they could move it around however they needed. So, it, <clears throat> so coffee carts are super flexible in that regard. Their, coffee carts are also really flexible if you really like making coffee but you have a small apartment and every once in a while you need to shove it out of the way and make space. That's all I have as far as, okay, let's, we want to talk about um, underneath the coffee cart. Okay. Um, we do not define for you how everything underneath should screw in. It's, uh, that's very much on purpose because people have different configurations and they have different preferences. In our videos, you'll see how we do it. We flip it upside down and then kind of play a jigsaw and put everything so it looks good and then put holes in. When you buy, for example, our pitcher rinser and you get the pump that comes with it, it comes with mounting features as well as silicone dampeners so that it mounts the bottom and it doesn't make as much noise when this is refilling. <clears throat> the other parts of the decent, the, sorry, 
The catering kit similarly has a mounting bracket that lets you mount to the bottom and it has an on off switch that we can reach over here. And that's so that if you need to empty everything for cleaning, you reach over, click it off, and then everything is powered off. Um, it's usually the case that it's usually the case that you should buy a very nice power strip, maybe even with individual on off switches, and you should get one that has mounting features so you can put it upside down. From a safety perspective, that's great because if any water were to get inside the cart, it's not going to get inside the plugs since all the plugs are mounted upside down. Um, let me show, <clears throat> let me talk a little bit about what's inside the cart. In this setup, we've actually set up two water sources. Now, nice water is quite expensive. And in our case, we like to have nice water for our espresso machine, but the pitcher rinser can just use tap water. So in our setup, we have one big bottle of nice water for the espresso machine and one tap water bottle for the pitcher rinser. Some people prefer to have hot water for the pitcher rinser, if that's your thing. You can, for example, put a little sous vide immersion heater, and we've in fact done that so that when I use the pitcher rinser, it rinses with hot water. Uh, let's see, underneath as well. Anything else? Yes. Um, the dirty water that's going to come out of here, but especially from here, goes into a single place. And instead of having two separate reservoirs, what we do is we have one bottle and this goes straight down into it. And then from here, we have a tube that goes sideways into the side. Now, the reason I say especially here is because if you're making milk drinks, you're gonna be rinsing milk and that's gonna go here. And within a day or two, that milk is going to rot. So you want generally to have a fairly small, dirty water receptacle so that you empty it regularly, and after maybe a week of use, you just throw it out completely and get a new one. Agree with that? I'd agree with that, um, <laughs> simply because coffee has an amazing aroma and you don't want to spoil that aroma. Mm -hmm. um, and if you kind of leave that milk sort of festering in there, mm. uh, you will notice it after a few days. So, you know, save your nose. Smell the coffee and not the dirty water. <laughs> so generally I get a five or seven liter water container that has a neck that comes up like this. And the reason for that is the output of this um, countersink here is about yay large and it fits right into those bottles. And the idea is to not have much air gap there so that smells that can't come out. Um, yeah, the decent espresso machine was made to be pretty skimpy on wasting water. And that turns out to be quite handy because if you're carrying water out here, you really don't want to have to refill all the time. There are other machines that tend to flush a lot of water out. You'll find that the drip tray here is adding just almost negligible amounts of water. I'll cut that part, that's not that interesting. Um, what do I want to say? Ah, yes. Um, a number of people use generators on their coffee carts, and I would recommend if you're in a part of the world where most people are having coffee drinks with milk, that you get one of our 220 models, and really the 220XXL, as that's our commercial grade steam. Yes, it's nice to, if you're in the US, to run on 120 volts and be able to plug in, but 120 volts is going to give you slower steam. You should factor about 35 seconds to make a latte, whereas with that double XL, you're looking at about 20 seconds to make it. Even if you're in the US, it is not expensive to get a 240 volt generator. The ones I prefer are the ones that actually have two plugs, so you can run multiple machines and you're not losing anything. You're <clears throat> sorry. Um, and the extra flexibility you get of having a generator so you can just be anywhere, you don't have to ask for any power, is great. I do remember doing a festival in Berkeley, California, and we had six machines and one of them blew. We found out later it's because the electricity was not all that good at that cafe. So having your own electricity is maybe not a bad idea anyway. Okay. Are there any questions? Um. Okay. 
Pitcher, rinse, recover. Um, okay. Uh, you can go to the top camera. Actually, you can just switch as I, uh, as I do it. This is our own design pitcher rinser. There's a couple of things about it that are unusual. One being this is all metal. A lot of them are plastic. And as you bang on them with your portafilter, they don't last very long. There was a cafe in London where just one night of me being there, I broke it and had to pay to repair it. These holes are also custom. And the reason for that is you'll notice they're quite small because when you are basically out here working and pouring, um, it's not uncommon for beans to accidentally fall here. And the holes on the pitcher rinsers that I've seen have much bigger holes. And what happens is the holes are big enough for coffee beans to come in. That means they get inside there. The rinser then flushes them down the tube where the whole thing jams. And right in the middle of service, you now have to stop and basically get a plunger out to get those beans out or jam it. And you can see I poured coffee beans here to just demonstrate that they don't fall in and you can just basically brush them out of the way now. So that's just a small optimization because this, <clears throat> that's, just a, uh, that's just a small optimization, but it's a, a that's just a small optimization, but it's a good example of the fact that we've lived with this coffee cart now for, I guess, five years. We've been actually doing a lot of production events with it. And being a manufacturer, we can tweak it. And every little thing that bothers us, we can go back and, and improve. And I think we're at a point now where we're pretty happy with it. And I hope if you give it a try, you'd be happy with it too. Um, we're going to need 